Um, I'm going to go through, I'm not going to go through all the rest. So this is just a simple diagram if I haven't explained it well enough yet. Um, again, it's a 20 year fixed rate price for the solar investors. They privately finance, fund, and build the projects. They feed that energy into the grid. GRU pays them that fixed rate for 20 years. They add that cost, this is something I haven't touched on, to all utility payers' bills. Now, in our case, we treat it the same way we would treat any other purchase power agreement. And we uh, cover the cost of purchase power agreements if we were buying that energy from Progress Energy or from anywhere else. We actually add it to our fuel adjustment. So um, in our case, it's about uh, 70 cents for uh, four megawatts of power. The next four that goes in will actually again go down a little bit and down a little bit and down a little bit. But for, uh, it turns out, I'm sorry, 70 cents for your average residential customer who uses about uh, 900 kilowatt hours per month in Gainesville. So that kind of gives you some sense of the cost. Um, the day we actually signed the ordinance, it was interesting. As I said, we're a pretty small town, 130,000. Uh, there were so many people in the room from um, Germany, England, Spain, uh, New Mexico, California. It was so strange. I, in the middle of the meeting, I stopped and said, let's take a picture of this. So again, being that first adopter has had an amazing return on investment for us, and we've gotten an incredible amount of international interests, media stories. We've been in the New York Times, the LA Times, the uh, National Public Radio, and on and on and on and on. And you know, for Gainesville, we're actually the home of one of the best college football teams, or historically, we've had a really bad year this year, I have to say. But uh, historically, we've won many national championships. If you've ever heard of Tim Tebow, Florida Gator from Gainesville, um, plays for the Denver Broncos now. But we normally only make those publications on the sports pages. So to be on the front pages, or, or actually, I have to say, we were recently, does anyone know why else Gainesville was in the media internationally recently? That crazy Quran burning nutball was from Gainesville. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, he went, actually, the Canadian broadcasting company called me and asked to interview me, and I'm like, well, I'm not the mayor anymore. Call the mayor. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that guy's a total wackadoo. I'd never heard of him before until he started this kind of crazy stuff. But anyway, now he's getting free cars and all kinds of things. Um, so again, uh, more than 32 megawatts of projects. This is a more than six-fold increase already installed versus where we were before we adopted the program in March of 09. So it's been uh, not yet two years, increase of six-fold. Actually, it's, I'm sorry, I should have updated this number. It's more than that. It's more like 12-fold. I'll show you the uh, data in just a moment. And again, steady work into our community. Uh, now, I do want to mention one thing, because we've talked about the difference between net metering and feed-in tariffs. And I, do you have a net metering program here already? We have net billing. Net billing. Well, it's probably, yeah, probably similar. OK, well, we'll discuss what that means. But um, we actually saw more net metering projects installed than feed-in tariff projects, not because the net metering is more advantageous. It's not today. It may be in 20 years or 10 years or something, depending on where the cost of energy goes. right? So it's a little bit of a gamble. But it wasn't that the customers were saying, oh, I have the feed-in tariff and the net metering. Let me do the net metering. It was more that they heard about the net metering. They came on down, and the queue for net meter, or, I'm sorry, they heard about the feed-in tariff through all this media coverage or whatever. They came on down to do the feed-in tariff and then discovered the queue filled and said, oh, well, now I'm interested in this. What do I do? OK, well, you can do the net metering. Well, what's that? Explain that to me. Oh, OK, that sounds fine. There's still a benefit to doing it. but. Um, there's no limit to net metering. So part of this overall vibe and marketing happening on the private sector side uh, and so on and so forth led to a lot of interest in solar in general. Um, so there was about, there were 113 uh, uh, systems in net metering, more than a meg. 80 of those were residential, 33 were business, but the business were larger because they have larger rooftops available. 
Now again, to business, net metering is less advantageous because they pay a lower rate for their electricity overall. Uh, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but you can see uh, the rate classes are such that um, a residential rate is 12 and a half cents. The general service uh, non-demand is 14 cents. The general service demand, which are these are the ones with the biggest rooftops, pay nine and a half cents or so for their, for their electricity. And so um, those with the biggest opportunity to do uh, solar have a lower incentive under net metering. Um, I'm not going to go through this either. I'm going to try to get to the questions. OK, so I do want to talk a little bit about the rates, because you do see very widely variable rates. Um, again, but again, you have to sort of understand what else is going on in terms of um, the comparison to the underlying utility rates and whether there are incentives or whatever. Uh, in Germany, and this comes from someone at UCLA, I think, um, the German system pays uh, for solar between 48 and 64 cents, but again, you have to compare that to their underlying cost of energy. Spain, it's between 44 and 51. Ontario, and I get, I'm assuming they've put these all in US dollars, 44 to 76. Gainesville's, uh, the first year was between 26 and 32. It's actually gone down a little bit for the larger systems. And then Vermont was 30 cents. Um, and actually, I'm going to go through some of this. Um, the important information on this slide is that, again, it's based on the cost of building the system plus a small rate of return. For us, we came up with about between 4 and 5 percent rate of return. Um, this was ultimately what was adopted in the first year, that the, uh, we pay more for the uh, rooftop systems than the ground mount systems, again, because in Gainesville, it costs more to put a system on a roof than on the ground. Um, I'll also say for whatever, and it's also, you pay a little bit more for smaller systems than for larger systems. Um, I do want to uh, mention, for whatever it might be worth, that we also have something of a bias to put the systems on the roof because we feel like the ground has other alternatives for what you might be doing with it. So, um, and this was just in the first, this actually is a little bit out of date, but um, this was like for the first year, $5 million was spent on actual installation. Um, if you look at that uh, moving forward, that might be an impact of something on the order of $25, $24 million a year. Um, and under the Stimulus Act in the U.S., each job year was estimated at $92,000 per capital expenditure, which would translate for us into about 261 jobs in installation. Uh, in the, in the years, in, in the first year. So here's the current data, I think. Um, prior to adopting the uh, feed-in tariff, we had between 1980 and 2008, 302 kilowatts of solar PV installed. In the first uh, 16 months of the feed-in tariff, we had 2.8 megawatts. So you can see the dramatic increase. Um, and we actually, uh, this has all been updated, but um, we had uh, 3.2 megawatts under construction. This is November's numbers. Uh, again, this, these, these numbers are now slightly out of date, but you can see just graphically, dramatically. Um, the, this is sort of where the, uh, I'm sorry, that, that those dates are wrong. I wonder how that happened. But this is about 08. That's so strange. I wonder how that happened. Uh, this was when the retail net metering was adopted, and then this is essentially when the feed-in tariff was adopted. So you can see how the installed solar really substantially increased. Okay, this is current data. Sorry about that. Uh, the feed-in tariff projects completed about um, 50 projects have been installed again since March of 2009. Uh, that's about 2.8 megawatts. Net metering has done about 1 megawatt now, uh, but more projects, more smaller projects, 120 of those. And we currently have about 1.6 megawatts um, under construction, about 25 projects. 
uh, again, this has also led to greater competition, driving costs down. One of the other factors, obviously, driving costs down internationally is the manufacturing has, uh, and um, all of the issues about the cost of the panels themselves. But of all project sizes, it used to be $8.03 per installed watt. Uh, in 2009, it was down to 644. As I mentioned, uh, this year, just a few months ago, I had an estimate for 550, so continuing to drop. Um, and actually, mine is a small project less than 10 kW, so it used to be 842, 757, and now I'm down at 550, which would be like here. So you can see um, some of those uh, benefits of having a strong solar market. Um, again, new solar companies coming to town, capital. Uh, we've uh, revamped all of our zoning codes to be more solar friendly. Uh, there's a lot of activity around solar advertising in our community, which of course helps the radio stations and the TV stations and all of that. And again, we're seeing an improvement in the, in the, wa in the wattage. And there's actually work even for realtors and attorneys, folks running around trying to get people to sign up for these programs. So it's been kind of interesting. The other um, areas of the economy that you wouldn't expect to be impacted by this. Um, we've also gotten other indirect benefits. This was actually in Copenhagen last year uh, that I was invited by the White House to sit on a panel uh, to talk about all of the different things that Gainesville has been doing around energy and climate issues. Uh, we were also named a uh, Green Global Capital Challenge City by Richard Branson's uh, Carbon War Room Group. There were only 15 cities across the world named Paris, London, San Francisco, yada, 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 Gainesville, Florida. Yeah, that was kind of exciting. And he has a few billion dollars to spend, so that's great. Um, so just a few lessons learned. I will say, you know, we were not prepared for the onrush of applications. And actually, as recently, that for, for programs, that, for uh, systems that dropped out of the program, and I will say most of those were these speculative projects that people had put in that were, um, not financed or whatever, they tended to be a few larger projects. But they reopened the queue this October, and one of the things that they did, which I thought was sort of smart, is they said, uh, we're gonna do this by lottery. So it wasn't first come, first served. It was get your applications in for this week, and then any um, if there's a demand too great, then we'll choose by lottery. As it turned out, the demand was not too great. Uh, it may be in January, in fact, it will be. They're reopening it again in January. And they already have, uh, we think, more applications than they have capacity available. But you have to be sort of ready for um, the demand, the pent-up demand. Um, the ground mount systems actually did turn out to be more bureaucratic because of the way the zoning codes in our particular community worked. And for the larger projects, there were challenges around financing because there is still a ramp-up period for banks and other financial institutions on the local level. I mean, some of the big, in fact, Deutsche Bank is doing um, actual advocacy for feed-in tariff programs around the world. So there are some big international banks that fully understand and are interested in how this plays out in the financial markets. But for the small mom and pop type bank, you know, you have a barrier in terms of understanding, you know, what all of this means and so on. Uh, certainly there was a lot of lobbying from various special interest groups to get you know, the system to be more advantageous to them. And then there are other things. In fact, we're still working out issues around, for example, property tax liability. How is the system taxed and how does that impact the cost of doing it and all of those kinds of things. 